drop a like and do share leave your comments and do not forget to subscribe for more videos hello and thank you very much for joining me once again in this third part the final part of our three part lecture on goods receipt processes this part of this lecture we're just going to look as we hinted in the previous video at inbound deliveries we're going to look at their structure we're going to look at how we use them and then we're also going to look at how we uh, use transfer orders to perform put away this is going to be the final lesson and uh, hopefully we're going to be able to grasp these concepts and we're just going to put a nail in the coffin for goods receipt processes before we proceed to goods issue processes so to begin with we're going to look at the purchasing process which is sort of a recap from what we've already looked at in our previous session but uh, i find it important for us to go through this because it's going to allow us to pinpoint exactly where the inbound delivery becomes relevant in our purchasing process so our purchasing process the first stage is going to be our purchase requisition uh, the purchase requisition being the first stage and it is a interdepartmental form of communication meaning that one department is communicating to, to the procurement department a list of requirements that may need to be procured externally. So once the procurement department receives the purchase requisition, they are going to create a request for quotation, which is the second stage in our purchasing process. Now the request for quotation, RFQ, is going to communicate these requirements to our vendors. It's communicating these uh, the requirements that came from the originating department externally to our vendors. And when our vendors receive their RFQs, request for quotation, they respond by sending to the purchasing organization a quotation. So an organization typically will receive a large number of quotations. And the SAP system is going to help the organization select the best quotation out of all these quotations they've received. And now with reference to this quotation, the winning quotation, the, the organization is going to create a purchase order. The purchase order is basically going to contain all key information that pertains to this uh, order and from this purchase order it gives us the basis for performing our goods receipt now this is where uh, we, we sort of pick it up with today's session because when we're creating our goods receipt we can either do so using an inbound delivery or without an inbound delivery now when we're using an inbound delivery what happens is we are able to perform put away before we actually perform our goods receipt posting. So in summary, inbound deliveries are used when put away needs to occur before our goods receipt posting. But goods receipt in the purchasing process can also occur without the use of an inbound delivery, meaning that uh, the goods receipt is going to be performed purely using the purchase order, referring to the purchase order. But the only advantage with using an inbound delivery is that we're able to actually perform put away before our goods receipt posting. So as we discussed in our previous session, if you haven't looked at that, inbound deliveries, they allow us to perform put away before performing a goods receipt. And this is generally uh, more accurate from a sales point of view because it, it, re it represents stock levels based on stock that is actually available and has already been put away. Okay, so just a quick look at the structure of the inbound delivery. We find that uh, the inbound delivery is divided into two levels, namely the header level and the item level. Now the header level contains data that is valid for the entire transaction. This usually can be uh, in the form of vendor details, um, their address data, their contact details. The, these details are not gonna change throughout the entire transaction. Another example is the delivery date. It's going to be constant. It's valid for the entire document. Unlike at, header, at, at item level, that's header level, at item level, we find the materials that are included in the delivery. And we find that each material being received can contain its own unique data, such as the receiving plant and storage location. And so each of these materials are listed at item level. And they contain what we may refer to as material specific item level data. One material may be received into one plant and the next material can have a totally different receiving plant, a totally different receiving storage location. And so we find that at item level, we constantly have data that is only uh, relevant to a unique material and may be totally different 
the data that is relevant for the next material. And so that's basically the difference from the header level and the item level. Now for the item level, the material specific item level data is usually just copied or obtained from the purchase order, which is the preceding document. It's usually just obtained from that purchase order, but these are only default values. These are only values that have just been copied by the system by default, but they can always be changed if need be. They can always be modified and you can always put in a new receiving plant. These are not mandatory. mandatory. They don't have to stay the same way they are, but they can be changed to suit the particular transaction. So just a quick look at how inbound delivery works. We're going to look at the concept of confirmation control keys. Now, if we're going to use inbound deliveries in the system, it becomes mandatory for us to use what we call confirmation control keys. These confirmation control keys, for example, can be inbound deliveries or shipping notifications. These are set in our purchase order. And confirmation control keys basically indicate that the purchasing organization is expecting a form of confirmation from the vendor that the goods are going to be delivered when confirmation control keys are in place, vendors receive purchase orders via uh, an EDI system. And when they receive these purchase orders, they respond to them or they confirm them with a shipping notification. And this gives rise in the buyer system to an automatic creation of an inbound delivery document. Now, EDIs, uh, electronic uh, data interchange, basically refers to... Um, system that is placed that allows organizations to exchange documents electronically uh, as compared to fax which is going to be actually using paper the EDI system allows us to exchange documents electronically so once we create a purchase order our vendor is able to receive this purchase order confirm this purchase order with a shipping notification and once they've done that it gives rise to the creation of inbound delivery in our system in the buyer's system so just a quick thing to note when we're using confirmation control keys, which are set in the purchase order, we are not able to perform goods receipt based on the purchase order anymore. But once we use confirmation control keys, we have to perform our goods receipts with reference to an inbound delivery, meaning an inbound delivery basically becomes mandatory to perform goods receipt once we have made use of confirmation control keys. So in order for us to use inbound deliveries, we need to have confirmation control keys set in the purchase order. Now, the next step is going to be storage type determination. The system needs to determine the interim storage area for each item, for each material that is going to be received. In other words, the system needs to determine the interim storage area, goods receipt zone, and the issuing storage bin which is usually a dynamic storage bin with the number of the purchase order as its bin coordinates. So it does this by making use of the warehouse management movement types for materials procured externally. Following storage type determination, uh, the system is going to sort out put away and goods receipt posting. Now, transfer orders are required for processing put away for goods. And in this case, the transfer order must refer to the inbound delivery. Following this, the goods receipt posting in inventory management is going to complete the process. So as a high-level summary, these two phases, which is storage type determination and put away and goods receipt posting, with storage type determination, the system is determining where exactly the goods being received have to be stored, the interim storage area, goods receipt zone, and the issuing storage bin. This is basically a staging area, a place in which the goods are received and placed before they're actually put away into storage. That's what the system is doing at storage type determination. And now, with put away and goods receipt posting, put away now refers to removing the goods from the interim storage goods receipt zone and actually putting them away in storage into their respective storage bins. This process of put away requires transfer orders to be created in order to put away the goods. And uh, our transfer orders in this case are going to refer to the inbound delivery. And now once the goods have been removed interim storage area, goods receipt zone, and put away into storage, the final step is to perform a goods receipt posting, which is inventory management. And this completes the whole process.
So just two things to quickly note. Put away is a warehouse management process, whereas goods receipt postings are inventory management processes. So we perform put away to put the goods away into storage, into their respective storage bins from an interim storage area goods receipt zone. And then we perform a goods receipt posting. Now, this is updating our inventory management stock. When we perform put away, we're updating our warehouse management stock. Now we update our inventory management stock by performing a goods receipt posting. Now, just to take a look at negative quants, a quick look. It's important whenever we look at inventory management versus warehouse management, it's important that the system keeps our totals in sync. The totals that we're going to be getting in inventory management against those that we're getting in warehouse management have to be kept in balance. So in order to achieve this, the system makes use of what we call negative quants. And this basically uh, means that goods being received are going to be shown as negative quantities before goods receipt is posted. This means that in our process, for example, when we create our inbound delivery and we have a transfer order created in, with reference to our inbound delivery, we've performed put away, the system is going to record the quantities that we have received in our put away as negative quantities. This is in order to take into account the fact that put away is performed before goods receipt. So this negative stock naturally is going to be cleared after goods receipt has been posted. So take for example, we've performed our put away, but we have not yet performed our goods receipt. If an employee is to uh, request the system to display warehouse management totals, he's going to see those materials displayed as a negative quantity. And in inventory management, he's also going to be able to display those quantities received. And because this has been recorded as a negative quantity in inventory management, they are going to balance with those values that are shown in warehouse management. And once goods receipt has been posted, meaning that inventory management has been updated, this negative quantity is going to be cleared and updated properly in warehouse management, meaning that the system has managed to keep both inventory management and warehouse management totals in sync right through the process. Well, this brings us to the end of our session on goods receipt processes. I trust that this foundation is going to be very effective in helping anyone who wants to go on and research further. Uh, we've gone through a lot in this session. We've covered uh, very key concepts. And anyone who's willing to research further will definitely have a good foundation after going through what we've gone through here. In the next session, we're going to be looking at um, goods issue processes. It's going to be a very interesting one and easier to grasp because basically our goods issue processes are a mirror of what we have in goods receipt processes. So if you've been able to master what we've been doing in the past three videos, it should be a breeze uh, grasping what's coming up in the next three videos. Otherwise, thank you very much for joining me. Uh, once again, I hope you'll be able to join me in the next video that we'll make. Have a nice one.